Welcome to ancillary session number 103, Organ Trafficking and Trafficking in Person for Organ Removal. My name is Yukari Wero, and I act as a moderator for this session. We have two speakers today. The first speaker is Dr. David Matus, who is an international human rights, immigration and refugee lawyer based in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. He's a member of Canadian Council on International Law, which seeks to encourage the study of international law and broaden relations and dialogues between international lawyers, scholars, individuals, and organizations across Canada and around the world. In 1998, he was a member of the Canadian delegation to the Rome Conference, which established the International Criminal Court. He has been investigating organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience in China since 2006. He was awarded the Order of Canada in 2008 and nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2010 for his investigation on organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience in China. His talk in this session is titled as, Is There a Difference Between Organ Trafficking and trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal? Dr. David Matus, please. Uh, thank you. So uh, the uh, question uh, I'm addressing is, are, are trafficking in organs and trafficking in humans for the purpose of organ removal the same? Just uh, looking at the uh, language, one would have thought so. Organs, after all, are components of humans. Trafficking of a part is, one would have thought, trafficking of the whole. Any distinction between the two is bound to seem artificial. The notion that when a person is trafficking part of a human being, Britain is not trafficking the human being from which the part comes seems unreal. A distinction is nonetheless developed at international law. There are two sets of international laws, one dealing with trafficking in organs and another dealing with trafficking in humans for the purpose of organ removal. Before I present formally what this distinction is, I want to suggest why and how it has developed. One can argue conceptually for a differentiation between any two activities with different linguistic formulations no matter how close the terms seem in ordinary, everyday language. Yet international law is not developed by linguists or philosophers or even legal scholars. It is developed by states. International law operates in the sphere of geopolitics. International law, even if it does in some cases bind individuals, generally binds states. As well, even though NGOs may have a role in the drafting of international instruments, treaties are negotiated, signed and ratified by states. International customary law is not principles that individuals consider binding, it is principles that states consider binding on themselves. International law develops through the acceptance by states of principles and mechanisms that they, that they accept apply to themselves. When we are looking at state actors generally, we do not see just states run by governments which respect human rights. We do not see just states run by governments uh, which aspire to respect human rights. We also see states run by governments which are criminal, which engage in mass murder of their own citizens, which are totalitarian, which are corrupt, which seek community, which deny and cover up their crimes. States run by governments of the second sort do not support the development of any international law or mechanisms which is directed against them. That does not mean that states run by criminal governments stay away from institutional standards and institutions. 
On the contrary, these governments embrace these standards and institutions. Partly in an exercise of hypocrisy to fool the gullible and naive, partly to hide their misdeeds behind an aura of respectability, partly to attempt to ensure that these international standards and institutions and mechanisms are not turned against them. We even see in some cases states with criminal governments attempting to turn the human rights standards and mechanisms around to target rights respecting states in order to delegitimize their critics. The effort of states run by rights violating governments to attempt to ensure that these international standards and mechanisms are not turned against them is sometimes engaged by opting out of enforcement procedures, compliance assessments, individual petition options, and dispute resolution mechanisms. It is also done through linguistic quibbling, uh, assertions that the general standards to which they have ascribed do not apply to the particular type of violation of which they are accused. The United Nations Human Rights Council does not, for instance, just attract rights respecting states. On the contrary, some of the most egregious violator states are among its candidates for membership and even actual members. One can say the same for international human rights treaties. It is not just governments of states which respect human rights or which aspire to respect human rights which join in on these treaties. Many egregious violators sign on to these treaties, typically while avoiding the enforcement systems, staying clear of the individual petition mechanisms, and filing uh, reservations about dispute resolution procedures. All this is true of China in the modern human rights era. The government of China is, since 1949 has been ruled by the Communist Party guilty of an an ending sequence of massive human rights violations against its own citizens. Despite these atrocities, China has signed and ratified many human rights treaties. These include the Convention Against Torture, even though there is systematic torture in Chinese prisons and detention centers, and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination even though there is massive discrimination against Uyghurs and Tibetans, as well as other distinct minorities in China. China to boot now sits on the UN Human Rights Council. The particular focus of this talk is the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the Protocol to Prevent, Suppress and Punish Trafficking in Persons. China is a party to both. The pro protocol defines trafficking in persons to mean in part the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another per person for the purpose of exploitation. Exploitation is stated to include, at a minimum, among other abuses, the removal of organs. The government of China, through its prisons, detention centers and hospitals has been engaged in the mass killing of prisoners of conscience for their organs, mostly practitioners of Falun Gong and Uyghurs and also in lesser numbers, Tibetans and House Christians, primarily Eastern Lightning uh, or the Almighty House of God. For Falun Gong, the experience has been this. Falun Gong is a Chinese equivalent to yoga, a modern blending of traditional Chinese spiritual beliefs and exercises, begun in 1992 with the teachings of Li Hongji. Originally encouraged by the Chinese government as beneficial to health, Falun Gong grew from a standing start in 1992 to an estimated 70 to 100 million practitioners by 1999. The Chinese Communist Party by then fearing for its own popularity and ideological supremacy, decided to suppress the practice without a legislative or regulatory ban. The repression campaign initially led to a great deal of incomprehension. Practitioners could not see the harm to the government or the party in a set of healthful exercises. The repression led to massive demonstrations with banners and posters saying Falun Gong is good, as if the Communist Party had been mistakenly led into thinking that Falun Gong was bad or harmful. Practitioners failed to realize that the very fact that Falun Gong was good, or at least seemed so to the practitioners, was what led to its downfall. 
the party does not have to fear losing support to the bad. Only the good represents a real challenge to party supremacy. Be that as it may, the party arrested the demonstrators in the millions. They were kept in detention and makeshift detention camps all over China. They were tortured into signing documents, renouncing Falun Gong, denouncing their fellow practitioners and embracing the party. And if they did so, they were released. Hundreds of thousands refused to sign these documents, even under torture. So they remained in arbitrary indefinite detention, engaged in forced labor. The detained practitioners were systematically, periodically blood tested and organ examined. The blood and tissue type information elicited from these tests was circulated to local transplant hospitals and transplant wings of general hospitals. Chinese hospitals advertised aggressively worldwide for transplant patients, offering organs on demand, booked uh, in advance, even of vital organs. Patients would pay the hospitals and doctors a predetermined price paid typically in cash in red envelopes. When a patient showed up, the hospitals would determine the blood and tissue type of the patient, matching the typing with the information supplied from the local detention center or prison and dispatch a white van to fetch the organ. The detained Falun Gong practitioner with the matching organ would be brought to a holding cell in the place of detention and injected with muscle relaxants and anticoagulants. Once immobilized through injection, the practitioner would then be brought to the white van and the organ on order would be extracted. The uh, practitioner would die through the organ extraction. His or her body would be cremated at a crematorium at the prison or detention center grounds. The white, white van would transport the organ to the hospital for insertion in the patient. This, this process certainly looks like what the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons of the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime describes. It is both the giving and receiving of payments to achieve the consent of the hospital and prison detention system, which has control over arbitrarily detained Falun Gong practitioners, for the purpose of a particular type of exploitation, the removal of organs. There's not a plausible linguistic argument to suggest the contrary. Yet there is a very real political one. The government of China does want, not want to be found in violation of the protocol, nor does the UN bureaucracy itself want to run afoul of China. So the protocol is not applied. The protocol has an enforcement mechanism, but China has opted out of it. Article 15 sub 2 of the uh, protocol provides, and I'm quoting, any dispute between two or more states' parties concerning the interpretation or application of this protocol that cannot be settled through negotiation within a reasonable time shall at the request of one of those states' parties be submitted to arbitration. If six months after the request for arbitration, those states' parties are unable to agree on the organization of the arbitration, any one of those states' parties may refer the dispute to the International Court of Justice by request in accordance with the statute of the court. The government of China appended a reservation to this protocol commitment. The reservation was, and I quote, the People's Republic of China shall not be bound by paragraph two of article 15 of the protocol. Okay, so what was the UN going to do about that? Uh, the, um, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes, the UN bureaucracy charged with the work of the convention and its protocols was not going to say that China was violating the convention, but there was nothing they could do about it. They said instead that the convention did not apply to what, uh, and the protocol did not apply to what China was doing. I and a delegation from the NGO Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, uh, an NGO with the acronym DAFO, met in D Geneva in December 2013 with the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights to present a petition with nearly 1.5 million signatures from 53 
countries and regions asking the High Commissioner, then Navi Pillay, to call upon the government of China to end immediately the forced organ harvesting from Falun Gong prisoners, to initiate an investigation which could lead to the prosecution of the perpetrators of this crime against humanity, and to call upon the government of China uh, to end immediately the brutal persecution of Falun Gong. One of the people in the office of the High Commissioner with whom we met, uh, one of the officials, suggested we contact the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime in Vienna. We followed up in that suggestion on January 1st, 2014, a couple of weeks later, by contacting Mirella Damorfrahi, Civil Affairs Officer, advocacy, advocacy, advocacy Section in Vienna, asking for a meeting on March 21st, three months away. Mirella Frahi wrote back January 30th, confirming uh, the requested meeting. She wrote, and I quote, I'm pleased to confirm it will be possible to arrange a meeting with the UN Office of Drugs and Crime on Friday, March 21st. Please indicate your preferred time in the name of the people accompanying you. Thank you for your interest and kind regards. I wrote back uh, to Ms. Farahi on January 31st, the next day, indicating who would attend the meeting and the preferred time. But besides myself, uh, there was an international lawyer for DAFO from Spain and a delegation of four, one lawyer and three doctors, including my co-panelist today, uh, Dr. Alex Chen, then from the Taiwan Association for International Care of Organ Transplants. After our tickets had been booked uh, on March 4th, 2014, over a month after the initial con confirmation, Morella Frohi wrote back saying, with, requests, with reference to your request for meetings on 21st of March, I regret to inform you that owing to our forthcoming major commission meetings on narcotic drugs from 13th to 21st of March, it will be challenging for us to tie down a convenient time to meet. I suggest that we take contact following the commission meeting on this issue. I reached her by phone and sent up uh, and sent a follow-up email March 12th, uh, stating our group will be in Vienna next 30, Thursday and Friday, March 20th and 21st, and would be available to meet on short notice. On March 13th, I passed on this message from my Asian colleagues. Please let, let them know, that's the office, we delegates from Asia have already finalized our air tickets and lodgings in Vienna for this meeting. It would be improper to cancel this meeting on such short notice. These emails prompted a response from an unnamed superior of Ms. Frahi who wrote to me on March 14th. Unfortunately, as Ms. Dummer Frahi has indicated previously, she will not have the time to meet with you and the Asian delegation. Having already booked our tickets, we all came to Vienna. My colleagues in Taikot went to the office, uh, uh, offices of the uh, uh, Office of Drugs and Crime on March 21st and attempted on the spot to meet with relevant officials. This effort prompted a response the same day from Mr. Elias Chatsis, Chief Human Trafficking and Migrant Smuggling Section, Organized Crime and Illicit Trafficking Branch, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, Vienna. He wrote in part to Dr. Chen, my co-panelist, I would like to thank you for your message and for the interest in our work. I understand that you have been trying to reach me today. A meeting would not be productive as my section's work does not include what you refer to as organ harvesting, nor the other issues covered in your email. My section covers the UN protocols on trafficking in human beings on, and, and on migrant smuggling. I'm sorry I cannot be more helpful at this stage. Well, to me that seemed pretty straightforward. However, I thought I'd better get clarification from the person in charge. I then wrote to Yuri Fedotov, Executive Director of the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, uh, on July 30th, asking for clarification. I wrote, as a result of the exchange of the email attached between Mr. Ilyas Chatsis uh, and, and Dr. Alex Chen, 
uh, which has been drawn to my attention, I request from the office a clarification. Does the office take the position that the that transplant tourism and the sourcing of organs from non-consenting persons for sale are subject matters that fall within the subject of the protocol, do not fall within the scope of the protocol, or does the office take no position on these matters? On August 8th, 2014, on behalf of Mr. Fedotov, Mr. Tofik Murshudli, officer in charge of the organized crime and illicit trafficking branch uh, of, of the Office of Drugs and Crime, responded by quoting extensively from the protocol, but saying nothing more. His response amounted to a lot of words saying nothing. So we were left with the response just quoted of the chief of the human trafficking section of the office, that the scope of the protocol and the work of the office, and I quote again, does not include transplant tourism and the sourcing of organs from non-consenting persons for sale. Yet the office elsewhere, the Office of Drugs and Crime has said the exact opposite. The United Nations uh, Office of Drugs and Crime website, at least until March 7th of this year, uh, a few days ago, equated organ trafficking with trafficking in organs for the pur purpose of organ removal. If you go to the UN website for the office, the opening page gives the viewer the option of a list of topics. One of the topics on the list is organized crime. If the viewer clicks on that option, the viewer is taken to a web page, which again offers the viewer a number of choices. If the viewer goes down to the topic emerging crimes and clicks on the phrase read more, the viewer gets at the bottom of the page as one of the emerging crimes, Oregon trafficking and not trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal. If, if the viewer then clicks on that link, it is dead. Uh, if uh, the, the viewer goes to Google and searches organ trafficking, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crimes, the link states 404, the number 404, with a bunch of question marks. Now 404 is a code for an error message, meaning page not found. The Google search for the same material provides a cached page, a snapshot of the page as it appeared on March 7th, and, and not today. The page has the title, Organ Trafficking, and not Trafficking in Humans for the Purpose of Organs. The page uses the phrases Trafficking in Persons for the Purpose of Organ Removal and Trafficking in Organs interchangeably. This cached uh, entry states, and I quote, demand for organs has outstripped supply, creating an underground market for illicitly obtained or organs. Desperate situations of both recipients and donors creates an avenue ready for exploitation by international organ trafficking syndicates. Traffickers exploit the desperation of donors to improve the economic situation of themselves and their families, and they exploit the desperation of recipients who may have few other options to improve or prolong their lives. One factor that is distinct in this form of trafficking in persons, here as you can see, trafficking in persons is used and not organ trafficking, is the profile of culprits. While some may live, may live solely from criminal trafficking activities, others may be doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, and healthcare professionals who are involved in legitimate activities when they are not participating in trafficking in persons, again used for the purpose of organ removal. The trafficking in persons protocol supplementing the transnational organized crime convention includes trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal. Trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal was on the agenda of the Working Group on Trafficking in Persons established by the Conference of Parties to the Organized Crime Convention at its fourth session from 10th to 12th October 2011. The Working Group recommended that states make better use of the Convention and Trafficking in Persons Protocol in combating trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal. The working group recommended that states parties to the convention should encourage relevant 
UN entities, including the UN Office of Drugs and Crimes, to gather evidence-based data on trafficking and purposes in persons for the purpose of organ removal, including root causes, trends, and modus operandi with the aim of facilitating better understanding and awareness of the phenomenon while recognizing the difference between trafficking in uh, organs, trafficking in tissues, and trafficking in cells. So now we're back to the phrase trafficking in organs. The working group also requested that the UN uh, Office in Drugs and Crime develop a training mod module against trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal and provide a technical assistance, especially in regard to investigation, exchange and information and international legal cooperation. To the same effect, and uh, equally puzzling, is an introductory statement from the Secretariat of the Office of UN Drugs and Crime to the 10th session of the Conference of the Parties to the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, held October 12 to 16, 2020, just a few months ago. The introductory remarks, remarks made on October 14th for agenda item Three, other serious crimes as defined in the convention, including new forms and dimension of transnational organized crime had these comments, and I quote, serious crime is defined in article subparagraph B of the organized crime convention. These crimes have been identified by the conference to include, and then there follows a list of crimes among which is set out organ trafficking. Again, the phrase organ trafficking and not trafficking in persons. Well, is organ trafficking covered by the Organized Crime Convention, if not by the Protocol on Human Trafficking? Lest one thinks of organized crime as a non-state activity, I draw your attention to the conclusion of the China Tribunal under the control of, that China under the control of the Chinese Communist Party is a criminal state. The government of China as one might expect is was was not going to let the international system decide this issue in addition to the um protocol uh where china had made a reservation about the international court of justice uh there's a similar clause in the uh, convention on organized crime I, I won't read it out but it's it's practically identical and and china has made a reservation to that clause too it's it's article 35.2 and uh, the, the reservation China made to Article 35.2 was this, the People's Republic of China makes a reservation with regard to Article 35, Paragraph 2 of the Convention and is not bound by the provisions of Article 35, Paragraph 2. So the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes, in contradiction to the statements uh, that organ trafficking is the same as trafficking in, in, per, uh, in persons for the purpose of organ removal has made statements to the opposite effect and, and not just to us but more generally. In addition to the China specific statement we experienced, the global report on trafficking in persons in 2012 published by the UN Office of Drugs and Crime states and I quote, organ trafficking is not classified as human trafficking. For an act to be considered trafficking in persons, a living person has to be recruited by means of force or deception for the exploitative purpose of removing an organ. There's a large gray area between licit organ donations and trafficking a persons for organ removal. The UN Office in Drugs and Crime also in an assessment toolkit produced in 2015 wrote, and I quote, Trafficking in persons for organ removal does not encompass the term trafficking in organs or organ trafficking. So uh, the position of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime appears to be this, that organ trafficking and trafficking in humans for the purpose of removal of organs, those two concepts are maybe one and the same and maybe not. When it comes to China, they are certainly different. When it comes to China, organ trafficking is not included in human trafficking for the purpose of removal of organs. Moreover, because China has opted out of the relevant disputes resolution mechanisms, there's no mechanism to determine uh, within 
the, the, the Office of Drugs and Crime System, there's no mechanism to determine which interpretation is correct. So that, uh, of course, is an unsatisfactory state of affairs. And the question becomes, what is to be done about it? The United Nations itself, through the office of the Secretary General, proposed a solution. The, the UN, through the office of the Secretary General, produced a joint paper with the Council of Europe in 2009, noting that trafficking in organs and trafficking in human beings for the purpose of removal of organs and I quote, are frequently mixed up in public debate and in the le legal and scientific community. A and they added, this leads to confusion. Well, as we can see. The 2009 study concluded that there was a need to adopt an internationally agreed definition of trafficking in organs set out in a legally binding international instrument. And that happened. The, 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 in 2000, uh, in 15, the Council of Europe opened up for signature a, a convention against trafficking in human organs that did exactly that. One preambular paragraph states in this Council of Europe convention, uh, determined to contribute in a significant manner to the eradication of the trafficking in human organs through the introduction of new offenses supplementing the existing international legal instruments in the field of trafficking in human beings for the purpose of removal or of organs. The Council of Europe Convention leaves China on the sidelines. However, that does not make the convention irrelevant to organs transplant abuse in China. The problem of transplant tourism into China, after all, is not just a problem of insiders, those in China, but also a problem of outsiders, those coming into China. The problem of outsiders, those traveling to China for transplants, can be addressed directly without government of China interference by a focus on the Council of Europe Convention. The protocol, the UN protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons has 178 states parties. The Council of Europe Convention against trafficking in human organs has in contrast only 11 states parties and 15 others which have signed up but not ratified. Joining the convention is open to the whole world. It's not limited to member states of the Council of Europe and indeed one non-member state, Costa Rica, has signed but not ratified. Observer states can sign on their own initiative. Non-observer states, uh, observer states of the Council of Europe, non-observer states require an invitation from the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, which can, of course, be requested by any state. In addition to Costa Rica, Canada, the U.S., Mexico, and the Holy See are states' parties, uh, are, are, are uh, observers, uh, not states' parties, are observers to the Council of uh, uh, Europe. The confusion between organ trafficking and trafficking in persons for the removal of their organs is not just restricted to the international arena. It carries forward to the national arena. Many states, parties to the protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons uh, have le legislation penalizing complicity abroad in trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal. When asked to enact legislation to penalize complicity abroad in organ trafficking, and I indeed have asked many of them, the typical response is that we already have that legislation, pointing to their legislation in trafficking in persons for the purpose of organ removal. The result is that only a handful of states uh, have enacted extraterritorial legislation against organ trafficking. The further result is that only a few states have legislation which stands unequivocally, unequivocally against the most prevalent form of organ transplant abuse. How does the mass killing in China of prisoners of conscience for their organs happen? One reason I and David Kilgore came to the conclusion that we did, although far from the only, is that there's vast sums of money to be made from the practice. and in 2006, when we wrote our initial report, there were no laws against it, neither in China nor outside of China. That situation has changed today, but only slightly. Institutions under the direction of the Chinese Communist Party in 2007 enacted a law against 
uh, organ transplant abuse, which is needless to say not enforced against the Communist Party and state entities under its control. As well, legislation in China from 1979 and 1984, which explicitly allows organ transplant abuse, uh, extracting of organs without consent for prisoners, sits on the Chinese statute books unrepealed. Now, in addition to that 2007 Chinese law, there are a few countries with laws against organ trafficking abroad, but only a few. Foreign laws are not going to stop human rights violations in China. Only Chinese can do that. However, these laws can stop complicity in violations in China. Today, almost everywhere, complicity abroad in the killing of prisoners for their organs in China is still legal. And the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes has done nothing and will do nothing about it. At this Congress, we should be taking note not just of what the protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes have done and will do, but also what the protocol and office have not done and will not do. Those interested in combating international organ trafficking and transplant tourism who have come to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime have come to the wrong place. Those truly serious about combating organ trafficking must go elsewhere. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Matus. And uh, the, our next speaker is Dr. Alex Chen. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Alex Chen is a board certified attending physician. Master of Science of Global Health and PhD of Clinical Medicine. He is the CEO of international NGOs. He's also the international representative of Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, DAFOH, which was nominated for the 2016 and 2018 Nobel Peace Prize. He's an expert in clinical practice and medical research and specializes in big data analysis, health policy, and health economics. He used big data to analyze overseas organ transplant situation and policy outcomes in Asia. His talk in this session is titled using big data to disclose the truth. Dr. Chen, please. Thank you, Kari, actually, to make a great introduction about me. And thanks to Dr. Matus, made a very great presentation. And uh, it's, it's my honor, actually, to work with uh, Dr. David Matus for about more than 10 years, and he is a warrior in this field. And also, today, I would like to make some presentations to prove that what he said is totally true and also to, to, show some, to show some evidence that why this issue is so important. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, today is my honor to, on behavior of DAFO and Tycho, to make this presentation to how to use big data to disclose the truth. So, <clears throat> so most of the time that in order to, there are some many interesting medical questions and this is a very interesting medical question that caused lots of attention from lots of doctors around the world at the same time. So uh, it's a very common story for doctors in Asia or maybe in lots of the Western countries that about 10 years ago, most of the doctor, if they have the patients who are waiting for organs, usually <coughs> uh, some of the doctor will be recommended to a specific country. So I will show you the data where the country is. So, uh, so and, and also when we were practicing in the hospitals and I've been working with many doctors around the world, we also found that actually most of our patients, no matter in which countries, we all went to the same country. And so we look into the literature review in order to see that whether on the literature, the current medical studies, are there any evidence to show that actually they also have the same findings us. <clears throat> so uh, actually uh, we had uh, another three literature reviews from South Korea, 
Malaysia, and Israel. So in a Korean published paper, so if we look at the, the chart, it's about the number of the patients, Korean patients receiving overseas solid uh, organ transplantation between 1999 and 2005. And you may see here the left the picture is about the kidney transplant and the right side is about liver transplant. And uh, so you will see that the, the dark black uh, bar is about the number who went overseas for organs. So since 2001, the Korean patients went overseas, started to went overseas for organs and, and the number increased. And this is the dark bars increase until almost 21% uh, for the entire over, uh, entire organ transplantation cases, but liver transplant as well. So, about uh, in two thousand five, about thirty percent of Korean patients went overseas for organs, and by looking at the data, they all went to China for organs. <coughs> the same results are found by Malaysia uh, uh, transplantation registry data. And this is uh, the, the published. This is the published data by the Malaysian doctor, and they look into from two thousand two to two thousand six, about the fifty five hundred fifty five cases, and more than seventy percent of national total kidney transplant, uh, they went to China for organs. So you can see here, compared to China and India, and China about some, every year is about more than hundred or hundred fifty. Paid Malaysian patients that went to China for organ. And also, you can see, we will see the Israel uh, data as well. So, and also, since 2001 and until the 2011, still a certain number of Israel patients that went overseas for kidney transplant. And most of them, a uh, majority of them, are, went, are going to, were going to China. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, finding because no matter through our daily practice or no matter we look into the literature or never we have like uh, lots of meeting with the doctors around the world, we found a very similar sign and also a trend that most of the patients who if you want to get the organs in a very short time, they all went to China to get organs. <clears throat> so we also we discussed with the Israel doctor and this is a very uh, it's a real story about his patients. He shared with us that his patient can really went overseas for heart transplant on a specific date. So it's very unusual because if uh, if there are some patients in, in, in China or in a specific country, if you want to receive a, a heart transplant, probably you need to go to the hospital in four or five hours and then you will, you will receive the, the heart from, from the donor. But Israel has been about uh, 11 or 12 hours flight from Israel to China. But why the patients can flow to China on a specific date for heart transplant? So that is very scary. So that's what we decided to dig into this issue by using data science. So and <clears throat> so by so we have the team to discover choose to use in second data to analyze whether how. I mean, whether it's a single case or actually the case is actually huge, has a huge number around the world. So, uh, so, uh, so the only the, the 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 most comprehensive and available data in Asia is the Taiwanese uh, uh, National Health Insurance Database. So, uh, the, the some of our uh, our team actually analyzed uh, regarding the overseas and domestic transplantation. Uh, for kidney in Taiwan since 2000 and since 1999 to 2014. Uh, you can see the data and uh, the, <clears throat> the green bar is the domestic transportation cases and the yellow bar is the overseas uh, transportation cases. And you can see that actually in Taiwan um, since 1999 that the overseas cases are much more than domestic cases. It's very unusual. Because usually we expect that you couldn't really go overseas actually to just receive an organ from the people who just passed away, right? So uh, usually we expect it before we actually we have conducted a study. We think that the domestic should be much more than the overseas. But unfortunately, the data told us that overseas 
uh, the, the number of overseas transplants are much higher than the domestic data. And also the majority, 90, 95% of patients, uh, they all went to China for organs. <clears throat> and also the survival is also, uh, we also did a survival curve analysis. And so you can see here, green bar is a domestic transmutation. For the left side is for, uh, for kidney, the right side is for liver. And left side, you can see actually a green bar, and the green, the green line is the survival curve of a domestic transplant in Taiwan. And the blue bar is the overseas transplant, uh, overseas transplant uh, uh, survival curve. And you can see that actually the domestic transplant uh, survival, uh, survival rate is better than the overseas transplant. So in, so in, in common sense, if you are a patient in, 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 in Taiwan, you definitely need to select the higher survival uh, place to perform your surgery, right? But why we still can see like huge number of patients when went to China for organs, right? So this is very strange because uh, I mean survival rate is com overseas it is relatively lower than the domestic. <clears throat> And so I think this is because actually China can get the organ in a very short time. I will, I will show you some more uh, 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 evidence later. And also why did the patient decided to go to China instead of other countries? So China started overseas transmutation service since 1984, <clears throat> but, uh, but, it, but actually this kind of service dramatically increased since 2001, but why? So we, so that's why uh, David made his, uh, Dr. David made his concern is very, is very correct. That why, I mean, you know, for organ transplantation, we have, uh, China has a skill in, 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 since 1984, but why can they have such a huge number of, oper uh, of transplant surgery since 2001? It's because of organ source. So this, his concern is definitely understandable. <clears throat> And also, uh, there, uh, some people may, may say that actually not just China, but also a lot of countries also provide uh, 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 overseas organ transplant service. But if we look into those uh, specific organs, you can see the Egypt, Pakistan, Philippines, India, South American countries, they only provide overseas kidney transplantation service for overseas patients because maybe each individual has the two kidneys. But Chinese military service hospitals can provide not just liver transplant, but kidney transplant, but also liver, heart, lung, and pancreas transplant as well. So some patients in our through our interview, and they also receive maybe liver and kidney at the same time. So it means that if this is a living donor, it means that we need to kill the, the patients. And also through this number, we found that number don't, don't match by using our database. So if you look into the, either the UK and NIH database, you hear that the, the median waiting time to transplant in the UK is about 30 months. And, but here, if we look at the, so the, the each, in each country, UK will be considered one of the fattest uh, country to receive organs about uh, 1,000 days. But in the United States, you have to wait about 1,800 days. In Canada, you have to wait about uh, 2,500 days. But in China, you only have to wait for about 15 days. But some people say that maybe China, because it's such a big country, maybe it's easier or faster to get an organs. But it's, it's very interesting because uh, China is about, uh, <clears throat> it's about a 1.5 billion population. And about, about uh, USA is about, uh, it's about a 0.3, uh, 0.3 uh, a a billion population. So, so USA, uh, China is just five times, five times uh, bigger than USA. But why China can be 100 times faster than the USA, unless Chinese people has about 20 times organs compared to US people. But that is not reasonable. So we found that the data does not match. And so, <clears throat> and why the waiting, the waiting time uh, for major uh, organ in China can be Average two to three weeks, and this have been published by their own website on transplantation center. They say the average waiting time is about two weeks only. So, uh, so maybe because of the open source, maybe it's another issue. So, uh, so maybe because of the number of donors a lot compared to uh, it, so that's the reason. But when we look into the Red Cross of China, and this uh, since uh, until two thousand fifteen, the entire successful 
uh, 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 donation <coughs> donation uh, cases are just about 5,800 cases. And until 2016, their only successful cases are only 8,000 for entire donation uh, 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 transplantation. But, but if we look into all the data that have been published by Chinese uh, 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 medical society, just 2004, just this year, and they have performed more than 10,000 kidney transplant cases and also leave about uh, 4,000 liver transplants. So let's go back to the previous uh, slides. Until 2015, there are only 5,000 cases uh, of uh, donors. But just in 2004, we have more than 10,000 cases. So where are the donors from? They're definitely not from Red Cross, right? <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so maybe some of the, the Chinese uh, officials say that maybe the organ are from the executive prisoners. So yes, so the, the Dr. Uh, Huang Jiefu, the Deputy Minister of Health of China, he said that uh, he's, he published a paper on Lancet and on, in 2008, he said that up to 90% of China transplant organ were harvested from the executed prisoners. So uh, when we look into the data, and you can see the red bar is the, the, the data, the number of executed prisoners released by Amnesty International. But the blue bar is published by the Medical Society that about how many cases they perform for liver uh, kidney transplant. But you can see that although the Deputy Minister of Health of China said that 90% of the organs are from executed prisoners, but it's, it's, the, the, the number of executed prisoners is just so low compared to the actual number of published by medical society. So it's a huge discrepancy between the actual the official public data and medical society public data. <clears throat> and also another bigger picture about the anti-rejection drugs. So this is something that is very, also very important. I think it's very promising data to prove that actually there's still black, black market uh, in this country. So uh, if you can see the A drug has been widely used in many countries, including China, Taiwan, and globally. <clears throat> so we look into the entire the entire, the total drug market of this drug, about 800 million RMB is, is, is equivalent to 43 million US dollar. And for the total, re, uh, the, retail, the retail price of this drug is about, uh, one th about 20,000 RMB, that's about uh, 3,000 US dollars. So, <clears throat> so in, in, uh, by under specific calculation, we found that there should be about uh, at least 18,000, 80,000, 18,000 patients who are using these specific drugs for transplant in China. But the official number reported by Chinese government is about, just about 9,000. But 9,000 uh, patients, about 10,000 patients are receiving transplantation, whereas receiving transplantation, transplantation on 2015. But why there are about, about 20,000 patients they are using the anti-rejection therapy? And most importantly, it, this data, just one third of one selection of the drugs in China, there are three different selections, three different drugs they can use for anti-rejection uh, uh, therapy. So we estimated that actually the reasonable cases will be more than 100,000 cases in China and in order to match the data we receive from the database. And also if you, we look into Taiwan and so the globally, I mean, not all the trans, not all the patients need to receive the anti rejection therapy. Just forty percent. You can see either Taiwan or global. Just forty percent. But China, uh, if we count, if we also think that China also forty percent, so that's why the recent cases will be about uh, one hundred thousand cases. But here, the the, the official public data just uh, 10, 10,000. So I would say the ten times difference over here. And also when we look into big data, and we also need to understand the thick data as well, because we need to know what's inside instead of just, uh, just to believe what data told us. So uh, we interview actually more than 100 patients in Asia. <clears throat> and there are some hints I would like to share with you. The mediators, they are physicians and or maybe other patients who, who receive organs from China. 
And, uh, and also healthcare providers, who are those uh, uh, doctors provide this service? Many military hospital doctors or, or, or military doctors who can practice surgery in the public hospitals. <clears throat> and also we found that actually through the interview, we found that military healthcare system uh, is not, it can easily get the organs. So, and also according to the patient statements, so there are other patients from the Middle East, from Southeast Asia, from Northeastern East Asia, and also from lots of Western countries. So the situation before 2007 and the situation after 2007 are totally different. So let me share with you some case reports. So there is a, a 35 year old male for kidney transplant who will refer from by a Taiwan physician to go to China and a series of pre-transplantation exams were done, was put on schedule within one month. And he was told by the doctor that you can get organ in one month, next month. <clears throat> and the first pair of kidneys for the, we call the positive reaction in the uh, lymphocytotic cross-match test. It's, this is the test to, to confirm that whether both organs are matched or not. Unfortunately, they received the organ first and they found that actually the organ doesn't match for the patients. So it's not they received the patient first, they received the organ first. And then they had a donor's organ first and they found that it does not match. And then the patient tried four times in total for the entire course. And it means that eight kidneys had been allocated in his case. <clears throat> in case number two, a 40 years old the female for kidney transplant, uh, she was under hemodialysis on the 2001 May 11, uh, via brokers to connections to visit a doctor for pre transplant examination. About two weeks later, she received a notice from a travel agency. It's a travel agency that a suitable organ was found. And the travel agency set up a pre transplant briefing for patients, just like a seminar, and the patient data had been already been sent to the hospital in China. <clears throat> and when the, when the patient uh, arrived, at the hospital in China, she found that there are about the seven patients, seven family members in this uh, similar to a group. And the hospital provided orientation and collected payment around uh, 140K, 150K Hong Kong dollars per patient. <clears throat> and all seven patients received kidney transplant operation next day, all together, all together. So either there are seven uh, traffic accidents that just happened. They just matched the organs. They can perform on the same day, or the people just was killed, in order that the people just were just were operated, just uh, uh, seven donors just operated in the next days. We don't know. Okay, so situation after 2007. So there are four major points. Number one, military doctors cannot practice in the civilian hospitals and organ distribution system to reallocated organs. And only about 168 hospitals are certified to do organ transplants. <clears throat> and also organ source and donor conditions cannot be asked. So this is a case after 2011, she was referred by a friend's son who went to China for kidney transplant in 2011. And the, the, the physician in China, Dr. Mao, say a patient should get a kidney in two weeks. And Dr. Ma asked her to give a red envelope and a donation to his special charity without receipt. And when the patient asked about the organ source, Dr. Ma said it's not appropriate to ask the question about organ source. He simply said that the donor was 30 years old in good health. <clears throat> and the, and, and then the day after, the patient was charged an extra US dollar, about 70,000 of their surgery. The patient reported the patient from those high income Asian countries also stay in the same hospital. The total fee over here, as you can see here, the red envelope to bribe doctor, donation to the charity, organ fee for the operation, <clears throat> and medical fee for the hospitalization. You can see the prices over here. So, over, and also interesting part is actually organ transplant service now belongs to the international health department. Not so actually, this kind of organ transplant service is not to, just to serve, I mean, the domestic patient, but.
but mainly maybe international patients, and also for all local Chinese elites. So the comparison between uh, before 2007 and after. And before 2007, some, the open source are many from executed prisoners, but after, patient cannot ask. And the organ transplant hospitals before was managed by military hot doctors, but after international health department. And we can see here the price also in the past about 600 US dollar, but after uh, not <clears throat> about uh, 20K or, or about even 120K per liver. So waiting time, so, uh, <clears throat> so before 2007, so all the process was uh, actually patients wait overseas and then arrange a specific date and the patient can flew to China to get the organ. But after 2007, and then all the patients have to wait in China for one or two weeks to get the organs. But what we should do, what we should do actually, instead of publishing paper, instead of observe those data, what we should do, I mean, I mean, we are all doctors, and according to Hippocratic Oath, we should keep in myself far from all intentional ill doing. <clears throat> and also the, the Declaration of Istanbul, and uh, there are some like decorations here, that no the organ black market to prohibit organ trafficking, transplant commercialism, and also transplant tourism, and also to promote organ donation and to have a transparent and safe donation system and achieve self-sufficiency in organ donation. So uh, one of the country in Asia uh, has a, a pretty good successful practice I would like to share here. So uh, this is actually the, uh, done, uh, conducted by my colleagues at so and the study about the importance of the government organ transportation regulations and advocacy on changing patients and doctor behavior. So there are four major public policy processes. The first one is identify the problem. The second is advocacy for the issue. The third one is policy implementation. And the fourth is policy evaluation. <clears throat> so Taiwan and also some of the doctors and the Taiwan government found that actually there's an issue for the, this kind of uh, overseas uh, transplant uh, before 2009. You can see here that the kidney transplant cases, overseas uh, cases, are much more than domestic cases. And also the survival rates, the overseas are lower, uh, are significantly lower than domestic cases. So it means that the government needs to do something to change the situation. And there is some like uh, a publication in Taiwan that found that transplantation tourism from Taiwan to China began in the early 1990s and has progressed rapidly published on, in 2007. <clears throat> and another article published in 2014 85% of overseas kidney transplant cases of Taiwanese patients are performed in, in China. And, and something that, uh, of course, that some of the uh, human rights activists in Taiwan also have some concern that in China, prisoner concerns are subject to false organ housing on demand. And the majority actually, maybe from Falun Gong, uh, Uyghurs, and Tibetans, and other ground Christians. And among them, I think Falango would be the major victim group because uh, we look, if we look at the UN Commission on Human Rights, <clears throat> as a, a, a report, Falango's population within the entire uh, prisoners of conscience is about 66%. So this is the issue. So we need to advocate. So what has uh, uh, the, 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 the Thai code and also uh, uh, has done in Taiwan is number one is advocate to what is pop to the public, including documentary screening and health talk or maybe exhibition exhibition. And so to have the second step is to petition collection. And there's a worldwide petition uh, uh, against organ housing uh, in China. It's, of course, this started by DAFO. <clears throat> and that's discussing with experts. So we can see David Meadows here. So David Meadows, uh, Dr. David Meadows was invited to Taiwan attitude he has been just to, to discuss with the expert and also discuss with uh, with all the doctors who are in, very interested in this topic. And also to advocate to the lawmaker to have a press conference and lobby. In the policy implementation, that is uh, in 2015, the Taiwan Legislative Congress amended the Human Organ Transplant Act. 
So here are, here's the average abstract of the amendments. Number one, to increase domestic organ donation. So the government and hospitals should actively recruit potential donors and, to lower, and also to lower the threshold of donation. <clears throat> and telling patients that underwent overseas organ transplant are required to provide essential information such as name of hospital and physicians, etc. Any organs for transportation should be provided or acquired free of charge. An offending citizen would be dealt with regardless of the area where the crime is committed. And those doctors in the hospitals are subjected to fines to, uh, of up to about 150K Thailand dollar is about 4,000 pounds or 530K Japanese yen if they fail to submit reports. And any person who brokers organ transplant should be sentenced to a fixed term imprisonment, one to five years, and may be liable to for a fine of about 1.5 million Taiwanese dollar, as equivalent to 38K pounds or 5.3 million Japanese yen. So this is a policy evaluation here. So you can see here, there's uh, two major events happen for the for the organ, overseas organ transplant. You can see here, the orange bar is the actual numbers that for Taiwanese patient went overseas for organ, this is for China, That's, they went to China. And the, the first case was uh, prohibited medical staff to be involved in organ broken, broken since 2006. But that's a we can see number drop. This is the first wave. And the second is after a, a Taiwan government actually enforced a law for uh, for to stop uh, overseas transplant. And you can see after 2013 and after 2015, we can see a significant drop uh, for the numbers who went overseas. <clears throat> so if we can see here that uh, after law amendments after 2015, so the, the patients in Taiwan went over went to China or overseas, actually the number, the cases significant dropped compared to uh, before. So this is a conclusion. So moral advocacy among the medical community and public as well as the legislative inter intervention may significantly change patients' behavior or organ transplantations. So these significant changes show that at times public concerns about transparency of the organ donation system and ethical standards was important. So thank you very much for your listening and let's, let's fight together for a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for the most comprehensive presentation. Now, I think we have still have some time. If there's any questions uh, from the people who are listening, we would like to welcome. Um, it, it's David Maitis. Um I wouldn't mind asking um, uh, Alex a question. Um, are you uh, still collecting statistics right now? Uh, now the team, the team actually they're still collecting, but not very, not not very uh, fast. Now passively collecting data. Yeah. Do you anticipate doing another report? Yeah. Do you have a, a schedule or a deadline? Uh, that's let's go back to the team and discuss it of that timeline. Okay. Yeah, I guess the, I mean, the situation in, in, in uh, Taiwan was quite bad. And when it was quite bad, uh, uh, I mean, there was a lot of information coming out of Taiwan and, and now it's improved considerably. Um, but uh, of course, Taiwan has the advantage of, of the same language and in close contact. So it's, it's easier for the Taiwanese to find out what's going on in China than for others. Yes. Mm. Yeah, and also Taiwan has a very comprehensive database to prove to track, right? The, the situation is, you know, most of the health policy uh, uh, is very hard to monitor because we don't have specific specific index to track to track the, the doctor or patient's behavior, but because we have a national health insurance uh, database and also mm -hmm. we have a registry system, it's easier to actually to track actually the, whether the actual situation, yeah. 
What's your uh, view of the receptivity of the uh, profession, uh, the transplant profession in Taiwan to this issue? Are they mostly uh, supportive or critical or uh, disengaged? Yeah, so um, because I no, I haven't I haven't lived in Taiwan for about more than ten years. So, but for, from my observation, I think is um, they're still very uh, past. I mean, they're very they can understand the situation and they believe that before uh, they have a very transparent organ donation system in 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 some other countries. Otherwise, they won't you know take the risk to send the patient to the country to the to China. So I think they are very positive to this. Uh, most of them. Uh, very positive to this policy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how, how long is it since you've been to Taiwan now? Um, uh, about two years or three years, I mean, yeah. maybe, yeah. Well, I assume you're still in touch with people there a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And and uh, who, who's who's the, the like? Do you have, still have a DAFO group in in um, in Taiwan? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember the time that we were together in Vienna? Yes. Yes. Mm. What, what's what's your recollection of those events? Yeah, Vienna, right? I think, I think, I think it was great. I think, don't think so. Well, the, I guess the trouble was we, you know, they booked a meeting for us, and then they canceled it. It's it's true. I remember. Yeah, yeah. And we went there, went to the you know this is the lobby, and and then they canceled the meeting, and we mm -hmm. stopped, and so that's what we had to find the other way to actually to do what we should do in Europe. Oh, so it sounds like you didn't mind that much. Uh, of course we might, but you know, actually we have been, we have been, um, used to being, been, been, I mean, we have been used to, I've been shut the doors by others. I mean, mm. especially for, for the Thailand people, I've been, the door has been shut for them for more than 50 years mm. to the United Nation. So, yeah. So I think the, the colleagues are pretty used to it, but it's, well, I see. it's not okay. good. It's not <laughs> good. It, uh, for the Taiwanese, uh, <clears throat> yeah. the UN is nothing new. Uh, nothing new. They've been shut for ICAO, or WHO, United mm. Nation, or the United Nation related activities. They have been rejected. Even COVID nineteen. I mean, like an uh, expert meeting, they also be rejected to join mm. the meeting. Yeah. So they've been used to it. So from my colleagues, actually. In Taiwan, they don't have this, this kind of issue. Of course, they feel very sad because they were thinking, actually, this is the chance actually to really change the situation mm. around for the, uh, with the UN around the world. Mm. But unfortunately, mm. well, Yukari, uh, what about you? What's your reaction to what you just heard? My reaction. Yeah. Well, I I think it's very urgent for us to establish what's going on now. And I think it's very important to emphasize this is ongoing. Yes, of course. But uh, the, the problem with that is, is that with each uh, bit of new information, uh, there's kind of a rolling progressive cover up. Each new data stream disappears as soon as it's quoted. Uh, so it becomes progressively harder to find out what's going on. Um, and I, I, of course, we should find out what's going on, but I would say that the onus has to be on China to explain what it's doing. Uh, uh, China and all states should be transparent, and and China certainly isn't. Uh, and the absence of uh, it, it, it shouldn't be the case that a government can hide everything, and and then outsiders have to establish what's going on. It, it should be the opposite that the people who have control of the data uh, should be able to show what's happening and they're not doing that. Um, anyhow, I mean, we're, we're you know, uh, Alex and I and, and uh, many others are still working on this and we're, we're trying to uh, elicit data. Um, uh, I, I was interested in what you said, uh, Alex, about pharmaceutical companies. Uh, 
because I, I mean, there's a lot of uh, kind of underground activity in China with hospitals, with pharmaceutical companies, it's even more so. So uh, how do you feel you were able to get a kind of reliable set of uh, information on uh, on production of anti-rejection drugs in China? So, um, so um, uh, our colleagues actually uh, found the data through the published uh, papers in China. So these data are published by Chinese medical uh, profession, uh, professionals. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 So, uh, oh, and also, uh, so let me, uh, let me share, share that slide first. Uh, so, I, yes. Okay. Okay, so, so David, so, <clears throat> so uh, I would say the cases report is uh, this is the official report by Chinese government. So that is about uh, just one tenth compared to the reasonable cases we estimate through yeah, yeah. actually the, the, the drug market. So this is drug market published by uh, medical professionals um, in China, and oh. the retail prices we re obtain it from the pharmacy of China. And of course, that we need to adjust it for the actual price that that the drug that has been sold to the hospitals. So maybe we mm -hmm. count maybe just 0 0.8, about uh, mm -hmm. 20 percent uh, off compared to the actual retail price. And also, um, there's uh, three major uh, drugs that China is right now is using for for anti-rejection therapy. And uh, the first one actually is uh, actually has been used widely around the world, so it's common. So that's why it's easier for us to, to get the data for publications. Uh, and also, but the Xenapax and also the Ximpain, actually this is a domestic one and the price just half compared to the, the A drug. So maybe we assume that actually this drug may be a dominant 50% of the market compared to the A and B. So if A, just the patient who are using A is about 1,800, uh, about 18,000 18, patients, we 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 assume that maybe C patient maybe maybe about fifty, or B patient maybe also about uh, about twenty or about twenty or something. So in total, we guess it's about uh, about one hundred thousand per year at least. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, that, you see, that's another advantage that the Chinese <clears throat> have is is they can read through the Chinese medical journals with ease, yes. pick out yes. stuff like that. Uh, yes. Which, Something obviously, uh, um, the, the um, but I, I mean, an article, and I understand that you can get from the journals uh, information like that. But where do the people who write the articles in the journals get their information? Do, do they get it from the drug companies or from the hospitals? Yeah, so we don't have the chance actually to, to talk to the author. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I suppose I guess they wouldn't be that that forthcoming, uh, and um, I, I mean the, the Chinese situation is problematic in a lot of ways. The uh, uh, and and the the drug uh, system. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, a hospital is fairly obvious, but a, a drug manufacturing company can kind of spring up and not uh, be under very noticeable control of anybody. Uh, and uh, th there's a lot of, well, fentanyl is a, a big problem coming out of China. And uh, the uh, and of course, if anti-rejection drugs are making money, <laughs> th th there's a demand for it. Uh, and uh, the 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 drugs. I mean, the reason why uh, I'm sort of interested in the drugs is the the Chinese uh, government, the Communist Party in Beijing, have uh, tried different ways to address uh, the concerns. I mean, mostly it's just invective that we're anti-China or we're lying or uh, we're uh, functioning on rumors, stuff like that. But some of the, sometimes they just make up statistics. Uh, and and uh, one of the statistics they make up is, is as you point out, is anti-rejection drug sales. And they say, 
you know, our numbers of transplants have to be less than what you and I are saying because our anti-rejection drug purchases are so much less. So they make up one figure to justify another so, uh, yeah. figure that they've made up. Uh, and so I, I think it's, it's worth looking at this issue of anti-rejection drug sales. And I think what the figures you've got are probably right, because realistically, I, I think what's happening is the ratio is 10 to 1. I, I mean, that's yeah. what we're seeing. That what's actually happening is, 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 is 10 times what the government of China says is happening. Uh, but it's, um, you know, as, as, as Yukari says, it's all, always worth <laughs> trying to find uh, uh, up-to-date information. Uh, the, uh, I mean, one of the problems we face, as is, is you're well aware, is that China is, uh, the government of China is conti continually saying, we have reformed, everything is in the past, uh, and, and, and it's a new day. So, and, and then, of course, there's many people who are, are uh, willing to believe that uh, because it suits their personal convenience. So uh, when I go to somebody today uh, to say it's still happening, and they say, well, give me some evidence that you've got in the last 24 hours. I mean, if it's, it's two days ago, it's too old. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, to me, it, 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 it's, it's kind of a ridiculous approach to, to take that stance, but that's often what we see. Um, and, and so I, I think it's always useful to do what we can to, to get up to date information as, as hard as uh, the Chinese government makes it. Yeah, I agree with you. So, you know, uh, you know, it, you know, every time we, if we make the report, uh, probably uh, uh, the Chinese government probably want to make it up. So, um, so actually to manipulate the data again. So, so it's harder and harder for us to get the real data, right? So just like yeah. in 2003, the SARS pandemic, now it's COVID, mm -hmm. it's even harder for us actually to know the actual situation because we know that how we actually monitor them, how we're going to, uh, uh, how we really, how we're going to dig into the data and then know that which data source we are using and then they, it's easier for them actually to change the actual digits uh, in, in the database. So, and so the more the, the evidence we reveal and the harder for us to find the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the better, sure. But, uh, you know, I had, uh, I, I guess you're familiar with Haibo Wang. He's uh, the number two in the system uh, of organ transplantation in China after Wang Jie Fu. Uh, and, and he used to be uh, at one time head of the China Liver Transplant Registry. And China runs uh, four uh, transplant registries for heart, liver, lung, and kidney. And uh, the liver transplant registries in Hong Kong, the other three are in mainland China. Uh, and uh, in our initial report, David Kilburn and I, uh, I quoted from the liver transplant registry, which showed a big jump in liver transplants um, uh, uh, shortly after the uh, mass detention of Falun Gong. The, um, and um, it, 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 uh, w with, with these transplant registries, the hospitals report directly to the registries. It doesn't go through the health ministry in Beijing. So it's, it's a more reliable figure than what Beijing produces. So we produce our report and we point to the liver transplant registry and the data stream disappears. It's gone. So uh, I, and I meet Haibo Wang uh, at a conference and I, I say to him, you know, and he's head of the registry, I say, why do you take down the data stream? Uh, he says, well, we didn't like the way people were using it. If anybody uh, comes to us and asks for the data and, and tells us how they want to use it, and if we approve of the way they're going to use it, we'll give them the data. That's what he said. Uh, so uh, that, that's the way they handle data in, in China. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, but the patients, um, I mean, especially like if even we want to introduce patients to China or you don't want to, or even the the, the, the the Chinese government, a Chinese doctors, they want to treat their Chinese patients, but they need a real data to prove that actually whether they are making the right decision for the patients. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a clear, a, a correct uh, cases, and they don't have a clear the how many operation, and they, so how can they really calculate survival rates? How can they really cal calculate actually the real, like a uh, 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 treatment, a uh, 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 better treatment for patients? So. 
I would say that uh, transparency of the data actually is also patient's right. And the patient should have the right and to know that whether um, the data is true or not, right? So uh, I would say, I would say, um, yeah, the data transparency actually is a, I would say it's a, it's a common sense. I would, I would say it's actually the, the basic human right actually 21st century. Yeah, I'll just make one more comment and maybe we should stop because I think our time is running out. But um, it, you may be familiar with Ghazali Amanda the, from Malaysia, but uh, what he told me was that before a report came out, if somebody went to China for transplant, they would come back with a letter from uh, the doctor in the hospital that did the transplant. They say, these were the drugs, these were the treatment, this is the recommended post-operative treatment, uh, these were the complications of any. I mean, uh, very specific uh, information. After a report came out, all the letters stopped. All the patient came back with was the story they could tell, which put the doctors who were doing uh, treatment back home at a great disadvantage. And, and yeah. that's one, one of the reasons uh, that uh, aftercare, I mean, it, it, the post-operative result has been so bad uh, in China. I mean, to a certain extent, uh, I'm aghast that this has been the consequence of our report, but uh, the, the, I mean, it's what's important to the doctors in China, more important than the patient is covering up what they're doing. Uh, and, and, and this is the result. Yeah, yeah, right. Hmm. Okay, Yukari, I think probably we've used up our time. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Matus and Dr. Chen. And uh, uh, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to raise this important issue. We hope the session is contributing towards the UN sustainable goals of peace, justice, and strong institutions. Thank you. <laughs>